Hey, I'm Stephen Billings, and thanks for checking out this message today. We're so glad you're here and would love to connect with you. You can text 97000 with the words River Connect to share any prayer requests or just to say hello. It would be so great to hear from you. Lastly, if you would like to give to the River Church today, you can give by texting the amount that you would like to give to 84321. You can also head to our website and click on the Give tab at the top of the page as well. Thanks again for joining us, and I hope you have a blessed day. Good morning, church. As my name is Roy Townsend. I want to welcome you to the River Church. I'm the grow pastor here. It's my privilege when I get to speak to the church body on a Sunday morning, but I also is my privilege to be a part of many of the ministries and being help, helping and, and the oversight of a lot of things. And I just want us to not take it for granted that uh, we get to join together this morning, right? I don't want us to take it for granted that another church has decided they'd like to become part of the River Church. I don't want to take it for granted. I was texting with Mitchell, our River Kids director, yesterday, and he said, you know, I said, what, what's going on? How, how did camp go? I used to go to little kid camp when I was young, right? I used to go and I used to help run it, and he said there were 230 plus kids kindergartners, first graders, second graders, right, that went to camp. And I said, you know, what was special? And he said, all the kids memorized the same verse. And he said, it's been, you know, all the kids actually memorized this verse as they grew together. And he said it was Mark 12, verses 30 and 31. And I just wanted to talk about that for a second. I just thought it would be super exciting for us to hear what the kids of our church, what they memorized. And it says, And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. All of the kids, all 230 kids grew in God's word with such a powerful message there. And that was on the heels of our student camps, right? We had professions of faith. We had baptisms. It's just an exciting time for us to stop and reflect and say, thank you, Lord. Thank you for the ability to gather. Thank you for this blessing. Thank you that our kids were able to go away and be loved and what they were able to learn from your word be thankful that we have the opportunity to have a, a summer outing next week, right? Be thankful that we have all the, that we've been learning in the book of Revelation. So if you are just joining us, we are finishing this week and next week our study of the book of Revelation. And it's been, a, it's been 17 weeks. We've been studying. We've been going through it. It's been powerful in many ways. It's caused a lot of questions for people. And I remind people, we still have the text to question. If you come across a question, something you need to know, you can text 97,000. You can type the word revelation without an S. That's the joke. It's revelation without an S. But please do that. I was able to join you guys last week remotely. I was off on vacation, but I was able to join online, and I got to hear Pat's sermon. And I know he was, that was a tough sermon on hell on judgment, on the consequences for our sins and our wrongs in this world. But we are also excited that we have the opportunity to share today God's reward. So in Revelation, we'll see this judgment. We'll see that, but we'll also see the reward of heaven. We're going to talk about heaven today and study in on that a little bit. But I was really moved when Pat mentioned some of the modern-day atheists who they think they're going to get a chance to tell God off. You know, they, they think, oh, yeah, when I stand before the judge, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell him, how dare you? And it's something that's inbred in our culture. It's in something that, that we, we feel we have a right to share this. But when I want to encourage us, those of you who know Jesus Christ as your Savior, we didn't deserve the payment that he gave us. He died on the cross for our sins. He prepared a way for us. He was the sacrifice. He was the ransom so that you and I can have a right relationship with God. It's not about telling him off. 
There's a lot of hurts in this world, and we know that. Revelation brings up a lot of those messages, you know, scary sometimes when you hear about this judgment that's going to happen. But just like God's judgment is not random, it is a plan. God's reward is not random. There is a plan, and that's what we're going to talk about today. That's what we're going to look at. We're going to study, delve into. Pat spoke about this material world being destroyed. Eventually, the book of Revelation records that. And then it says a new heaven and earth will be created and will be the before the judge one day. And it says very clearly, for those of you that still say, Roy, I'm not so sure I agree with you. I think I'm going to get the opportunity to tell him off. It says in the scripture pretty clearly that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Pat said it clearly and I loved it. This isn't a trial. It will be a sentencing for those who don't understand, for those who don't come to that knowledge of who Jesus Christ is. Also, when we talk about heaven, I've been convicted by talking to younger people and they say, this is the message they give me. Like, you, you don't make heaven sound very appealing. And if we are not making heaven sound appealing, then we are missing it as a church. So just like the book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ to us, we have to make sure as the church that we properly talk about the judgment, but that we properly talk about this wonderful blessing of heaven. It was interesting to me, I looked it up because I really wanted to know I'm one of those weird guys, I like statistics. So Pew Research did a, a poll and they said, okay, we're gonna do a poll. How many people think they're gonna go to hell and how many people think they're gonna go to heaven? And it was interesting to me, for every one person who thinks they're gonna go to hell, there's 120 people who think they're gonna go to heaven. Isn't that weird? Huh, maybe we only want the good, we don't want the bad, right? But the same book that tells us what hell is is the same book that tells us what Jesus Christ did. It's the same book that tells us what the reward of heaven will look like. And so we have to be careful. So for those of you that don't know, I was a school teacher, I was an elementary principal, I was a children's pastor here, and uh, we used to sing a lot of silly songs, and one of the songs that we would sing to the little kids to try to encourage them on this concept of heaven, and uh, I know it's, I, I have to clarify this because somebody said, you didn't sing it right because I didn't sing it like the hymn, but I sang it like a kiddie song. But it, it's really simple. And I had a, uh, we was on vacation and I had a little one that was vacationing with us, you know, two years old, a little, little younger than two. And I said, oh, hey, let's play this song. And it goes, heaven is a wonderful place filled with glory and grace. I want to see my Savior's face because heaven is a wonderful place. And then somebody goes, I want to go there, right? <laughs> and I said, oh, right, let's see. So I whipped it up on YouTube, you know, and I hit play, and she's looking at it, and she, she's loving it. She's loving it. And I'm like, whoa, this is an old song because this is like 25 years ago that I was singing this song. And they're like, okay. So I stopped it. I'm like, okay, that's enough. And she, she came back a few minutes later. And said, Play it again. Play it again. Heaven is a wonderful place filled with glory and grace. I want to see my Savior's face because heaven is a wonderful place. So that is the title of the message today. Heaven is a wonderful place. It's amazing to me, though, that 1 to 120, we have a lot of self-deluded people, right? We're self-deceived, thinking that I deserve heaven. No, Jesus Christ died for my sins, and that allows me to have that heaven. It allows me to have that because he has paid that price. It's also unique to me how heaven has worked its way into our vernacular. I was on vacation. We stayed on a lake, and I'd get up in the morning, and I'd go, and I'd look, and I'd see the lake, and I go, oh, man, this is a little slice of heaven, right? 
right? It's, it's in our vernacular, you know. All three of my children and my wife were with me, right? We're with a bunch of friends on vacation. I know that my oldest son is in college, right? So I know there's fewer vacations where the five of us are gonna be together, right? It's a little slice of heaven for me. I get to be with my family. Everyone's together. We're intact. We're, we're together. We love each other. It's a slice of heaven. You know, maybe I wanna tease my wife about this, but you know, when I, she said yes, that was, you know, it was nervous for me when I asked her to marry me, right? But I would say she was heaven sent, right? Now, I don't know about you, I, my, my family's from Kentucky, I'll talk about that a little bit later on, but I had a granny growing up, and I had a granny that would whip you, okay? So when you were screwing around, she'd, she'd get your switch going, and she'd let, it, let you have it. And she used to say, oh, heaven help, help us. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't want heaven helping you, I want heaven helping me. I want a way out of this, okay? So if heaven's helping somebody, I want it to be me, not heaven helping you, because I don't want a piece of that switch, right? So there's so many things, how it has moved its way. I even met a girl last year. She said, oh, hi, what's your name? She said, my name's Nevea. And I walked around for six months and didn't realize Nevea is heaven spelled backwards, okay? So it was one of those things like, okay, heaven is part of our culture. 120 to one people think they're going to heaven, We have these pictures of what we think it's going to be, but are those pictures, are they based upon what the scripture teaches? Now, I started thinking about heaven being part of our our language, and then I started thinking about, oh, you know, there was that country song that, uh, you know, prop me up beside the jukebox when I die. Yeah, and then I I don't know why, I never, until I was studying for this, the very next line says, I want to go to heaven, but I don't want to go tonight. And then I said, oh, I kind of like that song until I thought about I want to go to heaven, but I don't want to go tonight. When I was talking to these young people, they said, you know, you make heaven sound miserable. Playing a harp, sitting on a cloud, wearing a white robe, a never-ending church service. Do you know how badly I want to get out of your preaching, Roy, sometimes? (laughs) Like, that don't sound like heaven to me. I don't know what's wrong with you, right? And so we have to make sure these concepts, these things that we're thinking about and we're talking about and we're presenting, we want to make sure that we look at what the scripture says, what those descriptions of heaven are. So we're going to be starting in Revelation chapter 7, starting in verse 15 through 17. Revelation 7, 15 through 17. Reading from his word, it says, Therefore, they are before the throne of God. And they serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. And he will guide them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eye. Heaven is a wonderful place. I want to see my Savior's face. And it's something that we, maybe we miss, is when we serve him now, we serve him, but we're apart, right? We're distant. We get to serve him. We get to love him. But I don't necessarily get to serve him and love him face to face in the same way that we will when we're in heaven. When you look at that scripture there, it says we're going to be in the presence. We're going to be serving him and worshiping him. And he'll guide us and we'll be doing all these things. But right now, there's a distance between us because we are here on this earth. The Apostle Paul gives us some encouragement when it comes to this. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 through 10, it says... So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith and not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. 
we get this concept of that separation. We get the concept, you know, King James says it, for those of you that grew up in the church, you know, absent from the body is present with the Lord. But now I'm in my body, so I am away from him, from that physical face-to-face -face ability of serving and growing in our love. But it's also part of the trouble that we see. Like to Judaism, the ancient Jews would have understood this. The presence of God was in a temple. It was in an inner sanctuary inside that temple. Even today, the Orthodox Jews go to the Wailing Wall because they're getting as close as they can to what was known where the temple was and where the presence of God would be. But for the Gentiles, like most of us, there was a court of Gentiles. And they could get to the court of the Gentiles, but that was as close as they could get to the presence of God. And then there was a court for women, and there was a court for men, and there was the priests. And then to really get to the presence of God was reserved for the high priest, right? Was reserved for a special time when somebody was the high priest, and they could go into the presence of God. Now, you and I, as New Testament believers, if you've come to know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you and I live in a time where we can go boldly before the throne, it says, through Jesus Christ. But we're still here. We can do that through prayers, through petitions, through worship, through adoration, through confession. We can do that in many ways. But we're still separated, right? We're still here. But heaven... We will be in the presence of God. We will be in the presence of Jesus who gave himself for us. We will be in that moment, in that presence, worshiping him, him guiding us, being able to love him in a more tangible way than what we see or what we feel like we can have sometimes. This concept of being a complete family. Even for me on my vacation, we're all together together. It was a slice of heaven. Why is it a slice of heaven? Because when I'm with my Savior and I'll see his face, I'll worship him, my face to his face, right? It will be heaven. It won't just be a slice of heaven. It'll be heaven. I'll be there with those of my loved ones and my family and my friends who come to know him. But it's also something that the early church would have understood when reading this scripture, See, we, we have it really good, right? We have it really good. It's hard when we think, you know, like, there's never been a culture more blessed than we have been. Whether it be technology, whether it be money, whether it be freedom, whether it be jobs, whether it be houses, whether it be, there's so much that we have. But sometimes when I have a lot, it dulls me to what heaven is. That's what some of our young people are struggling with because they have life pretty good, you know? Like, honestly, kids are beautiful, right? They're smart, They're, they have everything. They don't really need a lot. I'm not saying there's not some people in need, but for the majority of the Western culture, the majority of American culture, we have a lot. It says, Statistically, the poorest American is the top 2% of the world's wealth. The poorest American is in the 98th percentile of wealth in this world currently. Well, I know that most of us are not the poorest American, so that means we're above that, right? We have a lot. But because we have a lot, I can become more focused on this world I want to go to heaven, but I don't want to go tonight. I'm having fun. I got a good job. I got a good house. I got a good car. I got a family. I got all this wonderful things. I'm going on vacation, right? We can become dull to what that's supposed to be. The early church didn't miss that. That scripture talks about where they won't be hungry. Now, I'm going to be honest. I haven't been hungry too much in my life. You know, I get hungry, I go get food. Some people say, oh, Roy, well, you're very blessed. Yeah, like the majority of Americans. When you want something, you typically go get it. It might not have been what I wanted to eat, but I'd never had food withheld from me where I couldn't get food, and I would go into a mammoth 
hungry spot, right? Or thirst. It's something we just take for granted, right? You know, I was watching this show about, uh, it was uh, in the Middle East, and they're washing the sidewalk with gasoline. Because water is more of a resource there. They don't have water. They're not going to clean the sidewalk with water. But they have gasoline. Now, I don't know about you. I paid four bucks. Four bucks for a gallon of gasoline, right? Because I needed to take me someplace. Well, they don't need it to take them someplace. They used it to clean things. Because water is a resource. The early church were slaves living in a desert area. Water would have been a major resource. They would have understood what it was like to really be thirsty. We live in America, right? If you open up a building, you have to provide water. It's a must. There's going to be a water fountain. Not only is there going to be a water fountain if you put in a new one, it's going to be one that will help people with handicaps use the water fountain. It's going to be one that's been purified. It's going to be one that's had the water tested. It's going to, we don't even think about it. Where there's no hunger, where there's no thirst, and it says where the sun, you know, and I had to really research that, where the sun won't scorch them because they're working out in the fields, right? They're working in a desert climate, in a desert culture. A friend of mine posted yesterday, it was 116 degrees in Texas. I said, that's why I live in Michigan, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was hot enough, but uh, you know, I don't want 116 degrees, right? She said, God, I don't know what you're cooking, but it's done, okay? <laughs> Turn down the heat. Turn down the heat. And I said, we don't even understand it, right? I was, you know, Again, sorry for being a nerd. I love stuff like this. Like 80% of America lives where water is. You can look at it. You know, out there, everyone's, oh, out there and all those crazy places out west. No, there's very few people that live out there in those crazy places where there isn't a lot of water. But we, we just take it for granted, right? We live in the Great Lake. Waterford doesn't even have a straight road, right? <laughs> you can't even have a straight road. You've got to go around the water. Okay, Waterford, right? I think, I think they were onto something when they named it. Okay, so we read that scripture and we don't sometimes get it. But I want to let you know the early church, they got it. And I think we, if we stop and we think about it, we get this. There were the physical pains, the physical struggles that they were able to understand that God was saying, listen, heaven will be without those physical struggles. It will be where there's no thirst, where there's no hunger. I think it was three years ago, I had a, a couple in the church, and they came up to me, and they said, hey, we have some questions about heaven. And so I said, okay, well, give me your question, and you know, I'm in between you know, lessons that I'm going to be teaching for my growth community. I said, so I'll answer those questions on heaven, and then we'll, we'll get right back to it. So the first week, I got a question, and I researched it, and I went, and I taught it, and then I thought I was going to move on to my next lesson. And then 26 weeks later, I was still answering questions about heaven to people who grew up in the church. These weren't new believers. This wasn't new believers class. Just learned the Bible class. And I started thinking, man, maybe we've done a disservice and not talked about heaven and not taught heaven in the way that it should be taught because young people are telling me we make heaven sound like a place they, they don't want to go. Or you have the other people, you know, hey, I, you know, I, yeah, I don't want to go to hell. You know, I would like a little fire insurance, okay, but I don't want to go tonight. You know, there's a party next week. And I know I'm overstating it to make the point, but that's really the point. God's reward, just like God's judgment, is not random. There is a plan. I believe, and I've studied this through that book, that we are meant to worship. We are built and made in the image of God, and God created us to worship. The problem is we don't want to worship a holy God. We want to worship ourselves. I've said it a few times, and I want to tell you I mean it. I might not be much, but I'm all I think about sometimes. <laughs> right? right? I might not be much, but man, I think about myself a lot. 
You know? Like in between the gatherings, I thought, do I want to eat something? Do I want to drink something? Right? Right? I, you know, I might not be much, but I'm thinking about myself. Right? We worship ourselves. We fill that need. Oh, this one might smile now. Don't get mad. You know, we worship our freedoms. Well, I'm free to do that. I'm free to do this. I'm, we sometimes worship our freedoms. We worship ourselves. I mean, think about it. The Israelites, for those of you that don't know, there's a story where they walk across a Red Sea, and after they get across the Red Sea, Moses goes up on the mountain, and what do they decide to do? They say, let's gather all our gold together, let's make an image, and let's bow down and worship it. Right? What do I see people worshiping today? Take me, I will follow, wherever you lead. Right? Right? We worship our phones, we worship our technology, we worship our money, we worship our resources, right? We worship ourselves. We worship our children. Ooh, those are good little idols to have, right? Right? We worship our children. No, we shouldn't. We shouldn't. If we're making heaven sound like a terrible place, we have failed. If we're telling you to live your life to the best you can here and not worship God and not understand who Jesus Christ is, we failed. We know that this has been a problem for some time in human history. The Apostle Paul speaks about it clearly in Romans 1.21. It says, For although they knew God, which means that man is basically religious or likes to worship, worship themselves, worship their freedoms, worship their circumstance. Although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Futile in our thinking. That atheist who says he's going to tell God off in heaven, he is futile in his thinking. Why? Because he has a right. His heart is darkened. Our right? He died. A perfect God died for my sins. And now I have a right? No. No. We have to realize God's judgment and God's reward. You can't just sprinkle a little Jesus in there. You can't just add a little salt to the mixture, okay? It is worship him, be with him, love him, grow in our knowledge of him. Now, some people here today would say, Roy, I don't really understand what you're talking about. Luke 19.10, it's a short verse. It says, for the son of man, Jesus Christ is who we came to seek and to save the lost. So if you don't know today, we would teach you that the scripture says we have all sinned and we all fall short of the glory of God and we're lost in that sin. But Jesus Christ came to seek and to save the lost. 1 Peter 3.18 tells me, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. We want to say it clearly. We don't want you to miss it. We want to tell you he loves you. He died for you. And if you come to accept that, Jesus Christ said, I am the way, John 14, 6. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Except through him. Jesus Christ, that is the way. And once you come to that acceptance, then we have to grow. Grow in our love, grow in our service, right? Just like the little kids, just like the river kids, they memorized. Love your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might, with all your strength, right? John 14, verses one through three. Jesus is speaking. And he knew that we were going to struggle with this concept of heaven. And he says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself. And where I am, you may be also. 
We don't want to trivialize heaven. It's a wonderful place. We'll enjoy the presence. We'll be face to face with him. But because we have so much, we've dulled our senses. For those of you that don't know, I mentioned it earlier. My family is from Kentucky. Kentucky is a unique state. You can bury people wherever you want. So, you know, here, somebody dies, you go to the cemetery. There, we have family members buried everywhere. Like, my whole childhood was going to Kentucky and taking care of cemeteries. And you say, what do you mean? I mean, there were cemeteries when I first took my wife. She was like, she's like, what are you doing? I was like, well, I've got a gun for the wild dogs. And we've got a four-wheel drive pickup. And she said, why do you need a four-wheel drive pickup? Well, we're going to have to go through a creek bed, up in a holler, over a hill, you know. We're going to open up a gate to a guy's field. We're going to go through it, but we've got to close the gate because we don't want him to get mad because some of my family's buried up in there. And you say, huh? I go, yeah, yeah. You know, we get the casket out of the hearse and we put it in a pickup truck. And people laugh. I'm serious. Put it in a pickup truck because the hearse ain't going to make it to where this casket's going. Okay? Dressed up. I'm in a suit. I'm in the back holding on to the casket, holding on to the bed of the pickup, right? Because we're going up a hill. Okay? And we're going to do this. But when I get there and I see what's written on tombstones, I'm amazed at maybe what we're missing today. I love to go, and you're like, you're a weirdo. I know. I love to go to old cemeteries and walk around and, and read the tombstones. And when I look back, you know, 100 years ago, when life was hard, what I see on tombstones is he's going to his forever home. What I see in tombstones is he's forever with God. What I see inscriptions of, you know, in the, the Alcorn book on heaven talks about this a little bit. You know, you'll see people feasting, playscapes. You'll see people playing. You'll see beautiful landscapes. When I go nowadays, I see, oh, he liked motorcycles. Uh, you know, this was his life work. Here's the building that he built. Here's a picture of the building. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with motorcycles. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that being on a tombstone. I'm just interested in how it has changed. I'm interested. Like, what was the change? The focus is less on heaven. The focus is less on being forever with our Savior, which is where heaven is. The focus became a little bit more about me. What I liked, what I want, what I did. And it's just interesting to me. And we can see this, that as life has become easier, we have dulled ourselves to the glories of heaven. Philippians 1, 21 through 23 says, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which shall I choose? I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ for that is far better. Being with Christ is far better. But if I'm still here, he has left me for a fruitful work, a fruitful labor. We're talking about joining the team. And just like my focus on heaven in our culture has changed, my focus on loving others and serving others has changed a little bit too. I'm still here. I talk to senior citizens a lot, and they go, oh, nobody would care about me or what I do. I don't have anything I can do to help the church. I said, are you kidding me? If you're here, you're here for a fruitful work. I have young people, oh, you know, I'm too young. God can't use me yet. If you're here, you're here for a fruitful work. Oh, you know, I'm so busy. I'm so busy. Yeah, maybe we're saying yes to a lot of good things, but we're not saying yes to the best thing. I can tell you what the best thing is, loving the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, right? Keeping that focus on the things above and not the focus on the things below. But as I get more stuff, it's funny what owns me, right? You buy more stuff and then it owns you. 
I got to keep it. I got to get it. I got to build a barn. I got to build a barn, put my stuff in. And then my, my barn is full. And then I got to go get a storage unit, $400 a month, put my stuff in. Right? We get more and more stuff. We put our focus on the things here and not our focus on the things that are above. The one day we'll be in the presence of God Almighty with the Savior who gave the sacrifice so that you and I can be in right relationship with God and he paid the price so that as Pat taught last week, we don't have to pay the price for our sins if we accept the gift that he's given. Church, heaven is far better. Revelation 21, verses three and four, we get another little picture of heaven. It says, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. Now, I know there's people in this room that life has been difficult. I know there's people in this room that have lost loved ones. You feel that pain. You carry that weight of people that you miss, people you desire to be with. We know there is that burden that we see. I want to tell you, God's reward is not random. There is a plan. And we know that we will be rejoining our loved ones who know Christ as Savior. We know that we will see him face to face. We know that we will be in his presence, church, because heaven is a far better place. One commentator stated it. He said, the eternal state reveals that there is an incredible future for those of us who've received the Son and worship the Son. I believe that God's plan is God, a garden, and mankind. And Pat taught that as this world is uncreated, as this world dissolves, as this world fades away, that God gives us a picture of what that new heaven, the new earth, the Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem, that it will be God with man in a garden, in a paradise, trees, nature, right? We see all those things described in scripture. We even see the tree of life is mentioned in Revelation, that the tree of life will be with us where we will be with Christ. Church, heaven is a wonderful place. Church, heaven is a real place. It's a place where we will forever be with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who bought us with a price. Church, our challenge is to not to be preoccupied with the things of this world and miss the revelation of Jesus Christ. Someday we'll see that sweet face, that sweet face of the Savior who paid the price. God, a garden, will be restored with mankind. Will you stand, please? Lord, we love you. And again, we thank you. We thank you for the opportunities we have to gather together. We thank you for the opportunities we have to celebrate our summer outing, a new location, our children coming back from camp and the scripture that they memorized, celebrating the baptisms and the salvations, celebrating the volunteers who went and and served. Lord, we're thankful for those who serve and love your children as we minister to those in our community as a church. Lord, I pray that we don't take it for granted. Lord, I pray that I don't stay focused on this world, that I would say heaven bound in my focus to love you more and to love others more by sharing what you've done. We love you. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.